On today's episode, we're continuing with our conversation with Laura Duncan, emotional health consultant from Redding, California. And we started doing this podcast, Triggered and True, to help people along their journey towards emotional health. And Laura's been working with people in emotional health for many years. And she has a wealth, she has a wealth of knowledge. And we're gonna we're gonna tap into some more of that knowledge today. So we're going to start off talking today about shame versus identity. And this is a series of workshops that Laura's done live that I've been to several of those, and she's done some online as well. And we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about shame versus identity. So we're going to start with the first question that I have for you, Laura, to, to kind of prime us here. And it's something very common that I think a lot of people would come to you with a goal of trying to get better and they're hurting and they want to get better. So why is getting better and and this approach to emotional health, why is getting better not the goal? Well, yeah, exactly. What you're saying is true. People come, they feel feel like something's wrong with themselves or something's wrong in their relationships or their life. And so they're coming trying to get help, which is great. You know, when you recognize those things, it's important to get help with what you're going through. But with the primary goal of getting better, it actually adds to um, our shame of trying to get to fix ourselves versus recognizing that we already are who we were created to be. And we're just struggling. Our behaviors are just the covering up of who we are, which is ultimately shame. And when I first started this process, that was one of the number one things that um, was emphasized was not trying to get better, not trying to get fixed because really this whole process isn't about getting better. It's more about connecting to who you really are. And that's why with this podcast being called Triggered and True, we're walking through the triggers that keep us from being able to be our true selves. No, that that makes sense. And I remember when I first came to you, how reassuring it was when the first thing you told me was that um, you're not broken, you don't need to be fixed. So I I, I very much had a fix it mentality. And Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a lot of human nature, but um, yeah. so talk a little bit about how shame interjects with that. Cause one of the things you told me early on is that if my goal is to get better, I'm just stuck in shame. So mm-hmm. talk yeah. to me a little bit about define shame in your terms and just talk mm-hmm. about how shame kind of comes into this whole process. Yeah. So shame really is the root of all of our struggles, which I know is a really broad statement, but when you get down to what shame really is, it goes back to you know, story from a long time ago of the Garden of Eden and how the Garden of Eden, um, there, you know, quick summary, if people aren't familiar with the story, there was a tree in the middle of the garden that was the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. And God ultimately said, you know, do be free, do everything you want in this garden, but don't eat of this tree. And obviously, as the story goes, they eat of the tree and they know the knowledge of good and evil. And the first thing that they do is they hide in the bushes. They hide from God because they recognize that there's something wrong with them, which kind of connects to your first question of people recognize there's something wrong with them. Their first thing is to try to fix what's wrong. But ultimately, Adam and Eve were already who God created them to be. They were one with God. They were connected to him. But once they had that knowledge of good and evil, then they wanted to cover themselves to make themselves good. And they hid from God because they believed that they were evil. And one thing that always stands out to me in that story is that God actually came to Adam and Eve after he realized what happened because he knew what was going on in the garden. And he asked them a question. And I always think the question is so impactful because he, you know, I'm a parent myself. And if my kids went and ate fruit that was going to change like the story for the next 2000 years, you know, I would be very, um, you know, I'd be upset. I would want to come and punish, you know, just instinctively or, you know, reactionary. And I would want them to know like how bad what they did was. But the first thing that God said to them was who told you that you were evil. And I thought that was so powerful because the, the thing that he wanted them to, that he was most concerned about was that they believed that they were evil. And a lot of times people think that God is mad at us when we um, sin or we make mistakes, but he really wasn't mad at Adam and Eve. 
he was actually ultimately protecting them, having them leave the garden, because if they ate of the tree of life, they'd be stuck in the knowledge and good and evil forever. So he was protecting them, first of all. And then secondary, he personally approached them in their sin, in their mistakes. And if, if God was separate from us in our mistakes, then he would never have come to Adam and Eve in their mistake. But he, he goes to an angel and told them, you guys you know, messed up and now you guys are going to be, you know, you're out. You know, you're separated from me. But instead, he actually came to them and he told and he wanted them to know that they were not evil. That was his biggest concern. And that always impresses me. So that's kind of the story of shame's origin, but how it affects us and the reason why, um, again, getting better doesn't work specifically with overcoming and healing shame is that it's not just the knowledge of evil that we need to get better because there's something wrong or bad. It's also the knowledge of good. And that's one thing that a lot of people that know the story or have, um, you know, you know, read that they're really focused on the knowledge of evil, that they believe that Adam and Eve were good and they knew the knowledge of good, but then they ate the fruit and they had the knowledge of evil. But the interesting thing about that tree is it's called the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. And God didn't want them to know either. Otherwise, it would have just been called the knowledge of evil tree. And he'd say, don't eat of that tree because you're going to know evil. But he actually didn't want them to know good or evil. Because the more that we have to be good, that's where shame comes in, the worse it gets. Because what goes up of being good comes down and being bad. We have this you know, seesaw back and forth of good and evil that we're constantly trying to balance. But if you go back to the garden before they ate the fruit, Adam and Eve didn't know good. They didn't know they were good and they didn't know they were bad. They just were connected to who they truly were. And they were with God and there was no separation. There was no shame and there was no pain. They were able to just be connected to their true selves and being connected to God. When, when you shared this, the the first time, one of the things you said, you said a statement or the first time I heard it yeah, along the lines of the most detrimental thing in the garden wasn't that Adam and Eve sinned, which mm-hmm. totally is where my mind was. Yeah. Like, how could they, you know, mm-hmm. shame, shame on them. Right. Yeah, exactly. How could they do such a thing? But that wasn't the most detrimental thing because as, as we mm-hmm. know from before the foundations of the world, God had a plan yeah. in place for this, mm-hmm. but the most detrimental thing was that they hid. Yeah, exactly. Because I, you know, this is obviously taking some liberties, but I really picture they didn't have the component of the knowledge of good and evil and shame. And they made a mistake and they had the relationship of being with God. And they would have said, you know, God, like, you know, we made a mistake. We ate of this, you know, we did something we weren't supposed to do. And they had stayed in connection with God. It would actually look different. I'm not saying there wouldn't be consequences. And I'm not saying that there, you know, when, you know, there's still the things that God had them do as consequence for their sin would still be in place. But when they hid from God, that's actually where the breaking relationship came from. That's where I believe that God is the most grieved is not by what we do, but what, but we, what we believe to be true about ourselves in that. And ultimately also what we believe to be true about him, that we believe that he would be a God that we would have to hide from because of our shame. Well, and another thing very much at the core of that is, is who broke the relationship off. Yeah. So my line of thinking, which could totally reinforce shame is that there was something wrong with me. I was broken. I was dirty. God broke relationship with me because of sin. Mm -hmm. But when you read the story of what happened right after the first sin, you see very clearly that God Mm -mm. kept coming to be with them as he normally came and approached them. You know, it says they walked with him in the cool of the evening. He came and he approached them because he never separated from them. He, what they did, you know, could, could cause separation from a holy God because they were now connected to the knowledge of good and evil, but who they were, who they are was never separated from God. And that's the same thing is true for us. I always looked at it with like my relationship with God personally, as you know, when I did something good, God came close to me. And when I did something bad, God was far from me. And I believe like you're saying that it was God that came close and God that pulled away. 
But what I realized is he's always in connection because it says that when we were still making mistakes, when we were still eating from our own knowledge of good and evil, he died for us because he, he could die for who we were, even if our behavior didn't line up with what he did or will line up with what he died for. He died for us. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the other thing that was, was revelatory, something you shared that I'd written in my notes from one of those workshops was you said that no demonic army came and drove Adam and Eve into the bushes. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is something we do to ourselves. Yeah. And can you just elaborate a little, you know, shame is something we do to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Just elaborate yeah. a little bit more on that. Yeah, definitely. And so, you know, of course, in the garden, um, the sa- Satan, the serpent came and deceived them, but they chose to eat the fruit and they chose to do it. I do like, I do like to make a little side note on that part of the story too, because I think it's really interesting how um, serpent came and what he he was very strategic in what he told Eve because it wasn't like she was just like, Oh, I want to disobey God. You know, she loved God. She didn't want to disobey God, but what his deception was that God's lying to you. Um, if you don't take care, if you don't eat of this fruit, you're not going to be okay. He's not who he said he was. And that deception in it was so powerful. I really believe that caused pain. And what I see working with people over the years is one of the biggest pain spots is that those that you love, that you're closest to, like your caregivers or your people that you're in closest relationship to, that they're not who you think they are. And when we think that someone is not who they think they are, we're more prone to want to have that knowledge of good and evil to protect us from people not being who we think they are, or we believe people are lying to us. We believe that we need to take care of ourselves, that self-protection. And I just, it's kind of a side note, but I think it really mimics how we also um, are ultimately deceived to believe that the knowledge of good and evil is going to save us. If we get better, we're going to be okay. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it really, for, I think a lot of Christians and just thinking of how I grew up with if I, if you grow up with that wrong thinking about God and you're wrong thinking of that dynamic, shame becomes very much an ingrained part of your, because you are shameful. You are unworthy, you're dirty. And I kind of, I kind of had this vision of God as being, and this was even described to me before of pure and holy. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm stained. And if I came into his presence, I, I would somehow take away from his pureness and his holiness. And wow, what a, what a warped way of, of looking mm-hmm. at the scenario, because that is not what played out in the garden. No, not at all. And obviously Jesus had no problem being around a bunch of sinners either. So mm-hmm, exactly. And that kind of also connects to just my simple definition of what shame is. Shame says what you do is who you are. And that an identity says I am who I am, regardless of what I do. And so that truth of that, it's not you know, that's why he could hang out with Jesus could hang out with sinners and he could hang out with people that were not holy, not pure, because he could be with who they were as they simultaneously were sinning or having bad behavior because he can make the distinction between what they did and who they are. I think as, as humans, we're, we're very much raised to describe ourselves by what we do. You know, if anybody, if anybody were to ask us you know, who are you? Mm-hmm. We often yeah. start with our profession or, or what uh-huh. we do. Yep, so exactly. Just speak a little bit to that and just kind of as you work with people, how do you get them to see beyond that they aren't what they do? So a big part of what I do to help people figure that out is if you if you go back to being little, like that's usually where people first start saying, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, they're actually reinforcing um, what we do in that statement that what you do is more important than who are you? You know, imagine if we talk to kids and ask them about the characteristics that made up who they are, their identity, you know, what makes you happy? What do you like to do for fun? We have this, you know, connection with who the child was versus what are you going to be when you grow up as the primary kind of goal in growing up. And so also using that example as you know children uh, start out by starting actually the shame process by the emphasis being on what they do we can also go back to being a child 
to be connected to who our true self is, our identity, because when we come into this world, we are who we were created to be. We're made in God's image. But as we go through life un- unintentionally, you know, usually parents have the best in mind when they start to teach and introduce shame to a child. You're a good boy. You're a good girl. You're a bad boy. You're a bad girl. And we start to emphasize that behavior is more important than who a child is. And one of the my common kind of quotes or sayings is, what you do matters, but you matter more. And if we could emphasize that as a child, that yes, your behavior matters. We want to raise, and you know, a lot of times people start getting upset, even as I'm starting to say what you do doesn't matter because they're like, wait a second. So then we can just go and sin and we can go and make mistakes and we can go hurt people and we can go do whatever we want because it doesn't matter what we do anymore. It, because if who I am is if, is bigger than what I do, then it doesn't matter. But the thing about it is, if, if behavior is our primary goal, not just in children, but universally behavior to get better, then that is emphasizing that that is more important than who we are. And that is the thing that we want to start to um, recognize when we're looking at things versus good kids or bad kids. That's That's really good because... I've been in one of those workshops before where you were talking about this and I won't use the example because if that person ever listened, they'd be like, Hey, they're talking about me. But, <laughs> but I remember how upset he got because he really just wanted his kid to do something yeah. different. And mm-hmm. he felt like everything you were saying was giving the kid a pass. Yep. Exactly. And it was a huge trigger for him self mm-hmm. personally. So yeah. Um, and that's something we have to work through. And I was actually listening to this business coach one time and he was sharing, I don't know if this came from psychology or where it came from, but he was, he was sharing this concept called fundamental, fundamental attribution error. Hmm. And he's going on and on and it's using these really big words and it's really complicated. I'm like, that is exactly what you do matters, but who you are matters more. The mm-hmm. core of it was talking exactly. about like in the workplace to help see that your employees were not, um, if they're doing something that's wrong, that's not, that's not who they are. Mm-hmm. They're just, that's just their behavior. And we don't want to just look at people through their behaviors. And I'm like, this is exactly what, what we know. And, uh, yeah. They were just explaining in some really fancy terms that were hard to hard to comprehend. But. <laughs> yeah, no, it's popular. Speak a little bit to you know, as a culture, we seem obsessively focused on behavior. If you look mm-hmm. at the number of self help books, yep, seminars, webinars. I mean, it is, it is, it is wild when you think of how focused we are on that. And there's also all kinds of rules of life, written ru- written rules and unwritten rules. Mm-hmm. So just elaborate a little bit more. I feel it feels like we're almost being countercultural here. So <laughs> yeah, hear about that. Definitely. I mean, there's this thing that we start to believe and think about when shame's first introduces a child, and this thought and it comes in all different forms is there must be something wrong with me. You know, if I took a survey of people, even, you know, a group of children ages five to 10, and I asked them that question, do you think there's something wrong with you? Many, many children would believe there's something wrong with them because your behavior leads you to that conclusion that if I'm doing something wrong, if I'm not healthy, if I'm not whole, if I'm not getting better, then there's something wrong with me. But one of the things that brings me so much hope in meeting with people is that my belief is that there's nothing wrong with you, that you were created in God's image, that Jesus's blood has fully restored you to your original design, to factory setting, to innocence. But because we've eaten that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, we're constantly trying to become better because we think that there's something wrong with us. And so when we come back to who we are, I know that everyone's okay. They're just covered up. They, who they are is just covered up by that feeling of something's wrong. And then we have bad behavior, which reinforces that belief system. But when I look at people, I see one of the big things that God told me, he said, he said, that person sitting across from you doesn't need to be fixed, doesn't need to be changed. They're just covered up. 
Don't add anything to who they are. Don't try to take away from who they are. Work from that my creation's perfect, but it's covered up. And that covering up is, yes, the knowledge of good and evil, but it's also covered up by our behaviors that come from our pain that cause reactions. And then we believe the reactions is our identity. But I, like I like to say, they're just emotional allergic reactions. They're not who the person is. If a person absorbs that, has the absolute power to change their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To think that the way, the way that they are is, is perfect and it's, it's wonderful. They don't need to change it. Yeah. And they, um, the belief that you have to be changed is, well, and, and maybe this is a good time to kind of go there, just the, the other health effects. You know, mm-hmm. we're talking about emotional health. Yeah. But this, this, this obviously permeates into all kinds of our, our physical health and, and different things as, as well as that. Yeah. So this belief that there's something wrong with this is constantly trying to fix. And mm-hmm. when, when you shared, when you, when I first heard from you about the knowledge of good being as detrimental as the knowledge mm-hmm. of evil, I was, I was like, well, what do you mean? Good is good. You know? And it's yeah. like, what's wrong with good? Well, but what that, what that created and this kind of really resonated with me is we're constantly doing this calculus in our head mm-hmm. of, yep. of, am I good enough? Is what I just did good enough? Am yeah. I enough? And, and you shared a little bit about what that constant computing in our mm-hmm. head is doing to us. So just yeah. kind of uh, share a little bit more on that. Yeah. I kind of like, look at it, like, you know, be on like a hamster wheel, you know, you're just constantly frantically trying to get to the place of peace that oh, I'm finally enough. I finally did a good enough that I'm no longer bad. I'm no longer evil. And it's just this perpetual cycle of it because who measures good? You know, when do we arrive at good and good enough? Because we do something good and then the next day we do something bad. And then the next day we do something good. And the next day we do something bad. And we're constantly in this ping pong back and forth trying to ultimately, you know, balance the judgment, balance the judgment of good and evil. And the problem with that is, is there's never going to be an end. Mm -hmm. You're going to spend your whole entire life on this earth trying to get, be better, to be good, never actually achieving it because that was never the goal. And, and like you said, good is as detrimental as evil. I used to always think that evil was the problem, but good is just as much of a problem because that keeps us separated from God, sometimes even more than evil. I always, like most people, when they're not living a, you know, a good life, they know, you know, they know that they're, you know, you doing behaviors that are wrong or evil. But if you ask someone that's doing good, there's a lot of deception to it because they're like, I'm doing good. I mean, all the right things, you know, I should be, have arrived. But really, if you go back to what Jesus did on the cross and everything, it centered around that our good is not enough that we actually needed to be able to come back into relationship with God without the knowledge of good and evil. And that's what Jesus did. That's one of the miracles of what Jesus did was he restored us to the garden. He restored us to, he healed our minds from the knowledge of good and evil so we could be in relationship with him apart from the law. That was helpful because I think one of the things that you, I was struggling with anxiety when I came to see you and Mm -hmm. it was helpful for me to, because you know, we're left brain, right brain. And yep. obviously my, my left brain was a lot stronger. I was a lot more connected mm-hmm. to logic. Yeah. So it was very helpful for me to be able to connect both scripturally, what was going on in my brain, mm-hmm. what was happening to me. Yeah. So, but a lot of my approach to that has always been more logical, more, mm-hmm. more, uh, more intellectual than it has been experiential. Yeah. And my wife and I are opposite in that. So I, I get the experimental exper- experiential part more through her, <laughs> but then, uh, but then it was, so it was good for me to, to understand some of what was going on so that when it was happening, I, I at least had some logic to fall back on. Mm-hmm. And so I think people like me look at a lot of this emotional health stuff as being at first, you know, I used to think this, this is like the old me. Okay. I would have saw this as being, oh, you're just being emotional, or I would have looked at it as maybe even uh, 
a weakness. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was strength was actually a weakness because I just, Mm -hmm. I just pressed it all down. So I had all this shame and all Mm -hmm. these feelings and I just pretended they weren't there. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, so just share a little bit about that. And, and that's probably where a number of people that come to see you are. Mm-hmm. It's probably not that unusual, especially maybe for guys, but can you see, is there any difference between guys and gals in that, in that regard? And the emotional, um, how they process emotions. Yeah. And just the, the, sh- you know, I felt shameful to even be mm-hmm. dealing with any emotion besides anger. Cause as a, as a man, anger can yeah. be kind of manly. You know, yeah, you can, exactly. You can get angry and, you know, go bust somebody's head open or do something <laughs> stupid like that. Yeah. And it's kind of like, cool, mm-hmm. but to cry or be soft or have mm-hmm. compassion was, those were shameful emotions yeah. for me. So is that just yeah. me or was that, is that more common than, than I know? It's definitely more common. I mean, de- like you're saying, you know, stereotypically men definitely don't have as much freedom to be as emotional as women. That's how I look at it. If you look at your, our upbringings, you know, many times, like if a girl, a little girl is emotional, it's kind of like, oh, that's how girls are. And then if little boys emotional, a, a mom or a dad or a caregiver can say, you know, that's being a baby, that's being, you know, weak, that's, you know, boys are supposed to be strong, men are supposed to be strong. And so it's definitely how we're taught as you know, because men are really emotional. In fact, the very like to go out and be a warrior and to like protect women and children and to be a protector and a provider, that's actually a very emotional process. And we feel like it's emphasis emphasized with like the anger, like you're talking about, but behind that anger has to be this passion that wants to go, which is passion is an emotional feeling that wants to go protect. It's not a passive I'm just going to go protect as a robot. It's this emotional process that goes and protects. So just because male and females really, um, emotions can be expressed differently or felt differently being feminine or masculine and little side note, some women can be more logical and some men can be more emotional. So we don't want to just completely pigeonhole it as male and female, but stereotypically most females are more emotional and most men are less emotional. But what I found, you know, cause I work probably, um, pretty equally 50, 50 with men and women when I meet one-on-one and I found that men are just as emotional as women and sometimes even more emotional because, you know, because it's been suppressed, like you were saying, and because they didn't have the opportunity to feel it, once they actually tap into those emotions, there's a lot more emotions than they realized. Well, and it's a great example of how shame can block us from getting what we need. Yeah, exactly. Because that says it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, shame just has many tentacles. I think it is, definitely is the does. Moral yeah. Story. Yeah. So. Cause when I first started, um, you know, understanding shame or before I started understanding what shame was, I always just thought shame was just kind of like being like embarrassed or just like, you know, like, Oh, I feel shame because I did something wrong. But recognizing that shame is a lot deeper than that. It goes to actually like our, you know, early childhood development of how we are programmed and how we are wired and and what we believe to be true about what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And you said originally a little, a little while ago, how like there's a lot of things that are rules that are said or not said. And a lot of what we, the rules we're living under are rules that are made from shame to try to get us to be motivated, to be better motivated not to be messy, motivated to be able to go through life looking really well, looking like you're doing good, but underneath we're not because that hasn't actually been, you know, uncovered. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good. One other tentacle, I guess, of shame that I'd like to dive into is how does shame connect with judging others? Yeah, that's really good. So shame and blame are best friends. And you can see that going again back to the Garden of Eden story. So as soon as they had the knowledge of good and evil, and as soon as they were um, felt the shame of that, the first thing they did was blame. Blame Eve blamed Adam. Adam blamed the serpent. There's lots of blame going on. And the reason why I bring up that blame is that's really the beginning of judgment because ultimately that was the first moment of judgment. 
And again, I like to emphasize it wasn't coming from God. He was asking, how do you know, who told you you're evil? I don't want you to see yourself as evil. And Adam and Eve's response was, Eve, Adam did it, Eve did it. And then, you know, instantly blaming because mm-hmm. they, um, you know, because that was their place of displacing the shame and the pain that they felt from what they did. And so they instantly blamed, which is judgment. Blame is judgment. And how many people are blaming when they have pain? It's a pretty universal response to shame. It's a universal response to shame, but it's also the the default of a way to what we think we're doing subconsciously, subconsciously, we're trying to take care of our pain. So we're hurting and we're hurting because somebody did this and we blame them and hope that and somehow we we think it makes us feel better. So mm-hmm. you've shared you share this much better than I do. So share about what what's happening there of what's yeah. happening inside of our hearts at that moment. So, you know, I always like to put myself in Adam and Eve's shoes because we actually are all Adam and Eve, you know. And so when I think about them being there, so they had this relationship with God where that they were one with him and they were connected to him. And all of a sudden, when they ate that fruit, they recognized the knowledge of good and evil. They recognized that they were naked and they hid and separated from God. And when they hid and separated from God and God approached them, imagine love coming in because we've all felt it before. I, I believe something's wrong with me and I'm bad. And love comes in from God, from your spouse, from a family member, from somebody that cares about you. Love comes in and you feel the like the dirtiness, the uncomfortableness, that there's something wrong with me. And it starts to increase and increase and increase and increase. And then it's almost like it just like overflows into blaming the other person. I like to look at our pain and uh, what we're experiencing in shame as like this kind of ball of energy. And we don't know what to do with it. So it's like hot potato. We're trying to get rid of it. So I'm going to displace it on this circumstance or this person. And for a moment, I'm relieved because that rising tension inside of me, that love came in and I feel terrible and frantic, feels relieved because it's not my fault. It's this person's fault. But what happens when we blame, and this is what I always tell people, I don't want to shame people into not blaming and say it's bad not to, you know, it's bad to blame, don't blame. What, how I describe the detriment of blame is that when I'm busy blaming someone else, I leave myself vulnerable. I leave myself still in pain, still bleeding, because that pain never got taken care of. It just got suppressed or distracted by me displacing it somewhere else. And then you end up having that kind of like whack-a-mole game happening where you, you know, you blame this person, but then it comes right back to you. So then you have to blame this person and it comes right back to you. You have to blame the circumstance and it comes right back to you because we're never actually taking care of the pain. But if we actually took care of the pain, we would naturally stop blaming, which would also mean that we'd also stop judging. Mm -hmm. And all judgment is, is us trying to not take care of or not um, uh, feel the pain that's already inside of us. Every judgment starts with our own judgment of ourselves. Wow, that that gives a whole new layer to our command not to judge others mm-hmm. because yeah. as it helps us see what we, it says don't judge others because mm-hmm. really what we're doing is um, we're judging ourselves. Yep, exactly. It starts there. Multiple different ways of seeing that. Yes, through the Bible, because we're talking about kind of the origin of all this, but also in all different forms. It's We're definitely learning that. This is really good stuff. And to kind of conclude, you know, at the beginning, we talked about this being a goal of discovery Mm -hmm. and shame versus identity is, is really seeing where shame is impacting our view of Mm -hmm. ourselves. Yep, exactly. So we're discovering. So just talk a little bit about what exactly we're discovering. We've (laughs) hinted at it. We've kind of danced around it. We talked a little bit about it, but just go into that a little bit deeper. So we are ultimately coming back to who we were created to be, our truest version of ourselves. Before we got covered up, before we hid, before we blamed, before we were consumed by the knowledge of good and evil. We're coming back to that garden where they were, the Adam and Eve were just with, they were just who they were created to be and they were with God. And that's what we're coming back to. And when people, again, are trying to get, better, trying to be good, trying to get healthy, 
um, a lot of times they're just trying to figure out what the problem is to fix it so we can be okay. But if you were pain-free, if you took care of the pain that you've gone through and you fixed all the things and your behavior was perfect, you'd still just be connected to the knowledge of good and evil because the whole goal is to be able to connect to who we really are. It's like we want to heal shame as like the mask that's on us to reveal who we really are and who we really are. That's where it starts to become a little bit. This is actually so people can kind of get on board with shame, even though they may have looked at it a little bit differently or not understood how it impacted their lives. But they'll start to understand, Okay, I can get how shame has impacted me. But then it's almost just as scary or challenging or hard to now ask the question, who am I? You know, who are we discovering? And that is very confusing to a lot of people because we think we are what we do still. So now we want to say, okay, now that I'm better, what's my identity of this better me, this good me? But we actually want to go past it being about the the better version of myself or the good version of myself to who we are, because some of the characteristics of who we are could classify as bad to classify as not, not being good enough, even though that's actually who we are. Well, and who we, measures that? Yeah, exactly. Who measures yep. that? Mm-hmm. Who, is a yeah. measurement of good according to who? Yeah, exactly. And so some, you could have a characteristic of who you are, an attribute of your identity that some people could say was wrong or bad that you need to fix, but that's who you are. That's who you're created to be. It's never going to change and it shouldn't change because that is who you are. So when we are discovering who we are, It comes down to the unique characteristics and attributes of who we are, the descriptive words that we describe. It's so tricky because who we are is so much bigger than if I said the part of who you are is you are inspirational or you are, you know, kind or you are these things. It's very limiting because we're so much bigger than those words. But we have to kind of start putting those types of words to our identity. And you'll find that your truest identity of who you are will always be who you are, not what you do. Mm -hmm. If who I am, one of the characteristics is kindness. Kindness will be an, I will do kindness, but it will come from who I am. Not I do kindness as a act or as a way of loving people, but I am kindness and that overflows to other people. That's really good. And I think on a future episode, because we could definitely break out a whole episode on discovering who you are, mm-hmm. the yeah. different the different ways to actually go about that process. But I think how to leave how to leave this today would be, and I think this this would be very freeing for people. And this I, I I'm hoping that all of today has been very freeing with people. But the one thing I would want them to take home is that you're not on a fixing journey. And we talk about a journey. We've been talking about a journey all along. Mm -hmm. And Laura has developed a whole process called the compassion method. And everything we're talking about is part of this compassion method. Yeah. And your journey is not a fixing one. It's a discovering one. Fixing, maybe it's just me, but when I think of something that's broken at home and I have to go home and fix it, it's kind of like, "Eh, Mm -hmm. I got to go do that. Yeah. Yeah. But discovery, now that's a whole nother thing because that's adventurous and it's kind of like, it's a treasure hunt. It's it's exciting. It's exhilarating. It doesn't have the same, oh crud, I got to go do that now. Yeah. So, so that totally. would be that would be the take home that I hope that people, one of the many take homes, but the take home that I hope people take from this is that this is not meant to be a drudgery. This is exciting because mm-hmm. people are going to get to see who they really are and, you know, they're made in God's image and they're going to get to see what, what, what image part of God that they, that they present forth to the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a little side note, just when you said like, you know, if you're trying to fix yourself, think about, have you ever been in a relationship with someone that just wants to fix you? They just see what's wrong with you and they just want to fix you. So every time you go out to coffee, every time you go and hang out with them, they're just constantly trying to fix you. And how exhausting that would be and how misunderstood you'd feel and how disconnected you'd feel. And that's ultimately what we're doing with ourselves. Every time we come to ourselves in whatever type of emotional healing process that you're walking through, if you're just showing up to fix yourself, your relationship with yourself is going to be such a sad, disconnected relationship. But now imagine if people went out to coffee with you or people wanted to spend time with you to discover you. 
They wanted to know you. They wanted to understand you. They wanted to see who you were. They wanted to hear who you were, what a relationship that would be, how you'd feel cared for and loved and how exciting that would be and how you know fulfilling that would be versus if you were always hanging out with someone that wanted to fix you. And that is a great way to sum up what we talked about today. That's awesome. Well, thank you for the time, Laura, and look forward to doing this again very soon. Mm -hmm.